everyone. Thank you very much for joining us on uh, yeah, this last Thursday of our webinar series. It's been an interesting journey. Um, when we started, since we started in March or April to, um, to think about how we can engage um, yeah, our networks and our community with ideas that we're working on. And we started the webinar series and um, today is the last one. Thank you for all of you who've been joining us and who've been yeah, engaged and tweeted and asked questions and sent emails afterwards. It's really been encourage, encouraging and um, we've learned a lot in the meantime and we also hope to explore more more sort of themes and ideas and reach out to other networks also uh, network next year so we'll be continuing our webinar series next year and yeah thank you very much for joining us i'm seeing um, people logging on and from all over so maybe just in the chat box uh, yeah just write hi where you're from or where you're working and um, yeah what, what, what work are you doing i see some familiar names there We've got two presenters today um, on our CSFT webinar, Reinhold Mangundu and Hans Hangwe. They're both in Namibia and they're both young activists working in the community, doing amazing things. And I've also sort of done amazing things through this COVID lockdown period in, in Namibia with their local communities. Uh, Reinhold is a student at the CST, he's doing his master's degree with us. Um, on the topic that he'll be presenting about today, some of the work um, on games and the challenges of the SDGs. And his colleague Hans is also um, an activist uh, working with the Namibian Youth Coalition on Climate Change. But Hans is having a bit of a sound, sound trouble. So um, I was thinking maybe just to get Reynolds started so long, maybe just Reynolds, you can introduce us to what you're doing, where you are and we'll see how we managed to get hold of Hans in between. So I think there's been some connectivity problems on your side um, and um, the network isn't that stable, but thanks so much for joining us. And yeah, I'll, I'll give over to you to maybe just introduce you and um, let's see what Hans then, whether you can connect. Great, um, thank you so much, Rika. And hello everybody from all corners, hopefully of the world. Uh, my name is Reynold, and I'm a student at the Center for Complex Systems in Transition, and I'm currently doing my master's, and I'm looking at um, participatory games as sort of um, as tools for, for, for helping to understand sustainability challenges. Um, so today's talk really is to really give you a background and to share some of these exciting work that we've been doing in Namibia for about four years now. And Hans Hangwe, uh, my colleague, is also going to be sharing with us some of his experiences. And he has been for many years been a participant, participant, and now he's a full-on facilitator. Um, so why why we started with the games for the SDG? So in 2016, uh, my colleague and I, Justine Brebby, um, we were working for a small NGO called uh, Progress Namibia, which was this small enterprise that helped to promote sustainable development in African country. But then we wanted to put Namibian citizens on a sustainable development pathway um, that is very multifaceted in its approach under this bigger theory of change. Um, so we had yeah, so we wanted to do capacity building, sort of to enhance and synthesize young Namibians to be part of, to, to describe, um, to work towards their future in a very sustainable fashion. And then we have obviously other projects that look at finding new indicators to development. But today's, I think I'll be sharing much more of the work that we have done with young Namibians um, around the SDGs. Um, so what we noticed was the SDGs were very complex, and although we wanted them to be integral to, for instance, education systems in Namibia, and also we wanted to find a way where young Namibians could understand them in a very fun and interactive way. Um, so in 2016, um, just before COP21, we decided why not run a game that put them in the shoes of uh, negotiators at the conference of parties. So it was very successful, had about 40 young people. And then after that, we decided, okay, hold a moment. This was very successful. So why not start a series of games? So that is where it started. And ever since I've been coordinating and facilitating these games until 2018, 
when I transitioned into my Enfield journey and then the Namibian Youth Coalition on Climate Change took over and with Hans being the main coordinator. But then maybe just to share a little bit as to why we started this series of games. So we, there's quite a lot of research that shows that these games has potential for providing like an experiential learning opportunity just similar to when we were kids, we would often learn from falling from the tree or we would create a connection um, to the soil and to the plants when we'd be involved, you know, experiencing the beauty of butterflies flying and so forth. So that whole idea of, of comprehending phenomena in the world through experiences, through feeling and through sharing some of, of, of this phenomena. Um, because for instance, Namibia faces an area of challenges um, from poverty to inequality. So we thought of creating a platform where young Namibians would come to freely and interactively discuss um, around the SDGs. For instance, we have young Namibians in the shoes of farmers affected by drought, and then collectively, they will then co-create and navigate solutions to addressing some of those opportunities. Um, another problem is one, one also one of the reasons because it's the idea of complexity and how much these problems are interlinked. And the, and we thought about how to get young Namibians to critically think for themselves, but also to understand these relationships between, for instance, society and nature and, 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 and putting them through a set of rules and a set of conditions that are designed in such a way that test their thinking capacity, allows them also to experience, also to understand how the interrelation, the interrelations between these different parts within the system. Um, also, the games, perhaps most importantly, is the fact that they facilitate change and transformation through self-action. And most of the times when we run the games, whether it's a very serious game, whether it's a simulation role playing, after every uh, game, we then have a, very, a debrief um, where we create a safe space where young participants learn to ref reflect on their experiences. And it, I think that was one of that is one of our most powerful um, spaces within the game because through emotional, for instance, undergoing this emotional stance, participants really get to reflect and most of them share feelings that allows a mental mode shift, which obviously over the long term leads to behavioral change. Although it's quite difficult to measure impact, but we have started, we have seen that a lot of partic participants has been coming back to our games and most of them after our games has really started small uh, projects within their communities. And of course, promoting the SDGs at grassroots. Um, so over the last two years with funding from the Hans Siedl Foundation, we've been running these games in various communities, whether it's with children from disadvantaged backgrounds and so simplifying them at least and to contextualize them to speak to the Namibian context. Especially we've seen that it's, they are quite fun and very interactive and a lot of, and there's a lot of play involved and, and kids usually learn through playing and, and which is obviously part of a, 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 which is the human thing. Um, so also there's a deeper sense of creativity to it. I mean, one would be really amazed to see what many participants come up with. Um, especially I love running them with school kids. They come up with all these crazy ideas and, and, and I love it. And, and especially the idea of, of, of walking and running with um, um, futuristic ideas. For instance, we've run games where we have achieved all the SDGs, for instance, you know, like painting a picture on what would the world look like when all the SDGs are achieved, um, whether it's having access to clean water and sanitation, um, having, you know, all this where communities are living with biodiversity and, and all this type of stuff. So I, Hans was, I mean, I wanted, I really wanted Hans to share some of his experiences because Hans has started as a participant over the years and now he has been, become a full on facilitator and, and would have been nice to kind of share um, his experiences with the games and so forth. Maybe Rika, maybe let's just check if yeah. he's around, then I can continue later. Good, thanks for that, Reynold. Yeah, I think Hans managed to connect to audio. Hans, we, you want to see? Okay, thank you, thank you. Right. Um, I was actually having troubles. I actually had to change devices. Sorry, guys, for the whole delay. Hmm. But yeah, definitely, you guys can hear me, right? Yes, perfect. Okay, thanks. So um, the, the games actually started in year 2017, as Reynold probably I might have said already, but I think it was more of a test run in 2017 where they actually ran the World Climate Game. 
And uh, after, immediately after that, in 2018, then the game actually became much more sustainable because it was funded. And after it was funded, you know, for the first year of 2018, I was actually more of a participant. You know, I did not, although Namibian Youth Coalition on Climate Change was also a partner, uh, we, I did not actually not uh, sort of run the games at that point in time. So I was more of a participant. And from a participant standpoint, I got to tell that I actually sort of learned in order to sort of integrate the issues of sustainable development. You know, back then I was more of a climate activist. Uh, I actually joined the whole climate activism in 2015. But now what this games allowed me is to kind of integrate the whole things about climate change and how it actually is linked to poverty, how it links to all this variety of different goals within the sustainable development. So how it affects the economy, how it affects the social stability within or social cohesion in a, in a society, or even other environmental issues. For instance, you know, goal 14 and goal 15 as well, which speaks about life on land and life on water, life underwater. So all those kinds of things basically sort of, it's very much interconnected. And that actually speaks to the whole idea that we uh, sort of, as much as we are climate activists, we need to look at it from a broad standpoint of sustainable development. The other thing I gotta say is that it actually sort of made me gain some couple of skills of how to articulate myself on issues of sustainable development. You know, uh, you know those types of discussions that we take part, you know, where I part took in, uh, I managed to actually gain some uh, real insight as to uh, what it is all about. But obviously, based on, based on listening as well, based on uh, what the other folks are saying, I obviously managed to also learn from them. But also, you know, I managed to express myself and articulate myself on this issue of sustainable development, which at a later stage actually served me pretty well uh, when I became the facilitator of the game. Uh, so in 2019 is when the Namibian Youth Coalition on Climate Change actually became the chief facilitator of these games. And uh, in 2019, I think the games have been funded largely to large extent by the Hans Seidel Foundation. But apart from the Hans Seidel Foundation, there is obviously the British High Commission, which actually at a later stage comes in. They say, well, you know what, we could actually fund about two games as well. Uh, so we have run a variety of games, uh, eight games that are funded, but then we also try to reach out, obviously, to mobile games as well as much as possible. So what we'll do is that we'll, for instance, go to, let's say, youth conference and then run the games for free uh, with no stipend or any kind of payment. Uh, I think one of the mobile games was also with the Ministry of Environment and Tourism, where we actually get there and sort of played a game with the staff members of the Ministry of Environment and Tourism. Uh, so, but then, and by the way, the environment and tourism game was more of people which are staff members, which are the lower levels, for instance, cleaners, librarians, or probably somebody that is uh, sort of um, a secretary, a administrator, or things like that, not people within the higher ups. But what I thought is at a later stage, we also need to engage sort of people in the higher ups. It needs to be ministers and people that are actually directors within ministries, which are the key drivers of the policies within the country as well. So uh, basically, uh, we ran the game of a variety of audience of young people, mostly between the ages of 18 and 30, I would say. Uh, but I mean, like there were a lot of professionals which also um, pop up at our games usually. And then we um, also had a situation where, uh, for instance, uh, uh, at, at the Ministry of Environment and Tourism, you know, there were those who are grown ups, those are mostly people that actually already works for themselves. So I'll probably add by saying that although we, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll probably add by saying that uh, finally, just to close off, is that um, we we managed to kind of like uh, try to sort of take the games beyond the boundaries of Windu, because most of the time we actually host it in in the capital city where we are based. But unfortunately, we actually need to reach out there because talking about the issues of sustainable development it's much more larger, you know, and then Namibia is obviously a signatory to those issues. So we try to sort of pursue uh, all these kinds of things. So, but then um, uh, if time, did, I would like to just briefly talk about some few games that we run. For instance, a game like Privilege Work, for instance, Reynold might have already alluded to it, but it's kind of a game that actually puts uh, participants in different shoes, you know, depending on which member of the society they are. So they would actually have a situation where they would join in, uh, like stand in a horizontal queue, they would hold hands, and then they would start working. So depending on the question that the facilitator asked, 
then they would actually start moving forward. And you see that at the start of the game, people were very much tightly knitted with each other. They were holding hands, but all of a sudden, some of the participants start moving, and then the others are actually left behind, you know, until they cannot hold hands anymore. And that actually gets to show privilege within our society and just the inequities that, that exist within our society and the access we have to different kinds of things. You know, Namibia is like South Africa, one of the most unequal societies in the world. And these are obviously the realities that we are faced with. In conclusion, I would say that people are pretty much impressed with these games. And we see this with the feedback forms. You know, people will probably be like, totally agree or agree because there are five options generally being ranging, ranging from totally agree to totally disagree. And most of the times when it boils down to whether they've learned something from these games or whether they, are, they feel empowered in order to implement the agenda of sustainable development in their own personal lives, most of these people actually see, feel that they totally agree with that statement or agree with that statement, you know? So, so that actually gets to show um, just how motivated, inspired people are uh, whenever they go out there and try to instill that behavioral change. Some of the setbacks, obviously there are some setbacks as well sometimes that have transpired during these games. Like recently, we tried to take the games outside Windhoek, and we went to a place called Riepok, which is about a 45-minute 45, uh, 45 drive to Riepok, uh, I mean from Windhoek. And when we went down there, you know, uh, unfortunately, we did not have, we only had three, three people that showed up for, for the game. And then we actually had to totally cancel the game at the end of the day, and that, that was pretty unfortunate. Uh, so, so those are some of the challenges with regard to participation and all that. But what I've realized is as much as we could actually have a day that 50 people show up or a day that 20 people show up, uh, you know, these games are much more impactful when, and when it's much more intricate, when it's a small circle of people. So like when you deal with 50 to 20 people, you might actually make a great impact because at the end of the day, you want to instill some kind of emotions within these people. And the moment you talk to them, at a larger group, it gets a bit chaotic as well. So that I would say for now. Well, thank you very much. Um, that's a, a whole rich array of um, experiences that both you, Reynold and Hans have shared. And you've given us also a nice idea, Hans, of you know, what, what we should imagine a, a game could be like, you know, because um, I think for many people, um, the idea of games is, often thought of as, yeah, so what, you know, what is it? How do we play those games? What do they do? Um, but I've been fortunate enough also to see Reynold in action and uh, facilitating a, a game with our sustainability students um, uh, earlier this year. Um, and these, th these are actually, you know, highly, highly skilled, um, yeah, facilitation skills that you need in order to sort of, yeah, I think also keep the group together or to allow them to play or to, you know, um, change the roles that they are in. Because um, like you say, uh, Hans, often when people are, you know, high up in a certain kind of office or function, you know, they have a specific way of being or thinking and they don't realize, you know, how, how we make decisions with our emotions and our values and not just out of, you know, some kind of policy brief or whatever. So yeah, that's amazing. Um, Reynold, did you want to continue? I think what I'm going to do towards the end is, I think we are we are a nice group of people online here, and I, I maybe just um, I'm going to see if it's going to work, but I'll try and make everyone come on live if that's okay, and then we have a more interactive discussion rather than people posting questions and answers. Um, and if people wanted to speak, they must just raise raise their hands in the chat box or say that they want to talk, um, and then I'll try and facilitate that or write a question. If you have questions to Hans and Reynold, just add them in the chat box or the Q&A box and I'll um, facilitate that. But I'll, I'll try and make us all visible to each other. And um, and then uh, it's also a nicer way of maybe communicating. Reynold, would you like to maybe continue or add something in just in terms of the, yeah, the, the experience that people have when they play these games? Yeah, um, yeah, so last about last month we had a, a game jam in the desert and so the game jam is basically the idea of bringing together different groups whether it's from ministries whether it's students whether it's musician and the whole idea is to sort of develop 
every group gets to develop a game within 72 hours. And that was really exciting. And it, it was an experience that was so rich. And then because this just didn't teach participants around how to develop the games, but also introduce them to the idea of flexibility, in, especially in the Anthropocene and, and how and the, the game jam prepared them on how to really go through this design process that allows us not only to understand systems in a way, but also to anticipate change within these systems. Um, so it was quite enriching um, to be part of this gaming jam, um, sharing it with many, many young people. And at the end of the game, or at the end of the 72 hours, we had all this spectrum of games from serious games to strategic games to role playing games. And last week we, we played them with the uh, public. And one of the games which we developed was around the Recon Africa in the situation of Recon Africa in the Delta. And somebody actually said, you guys just manifested whatever that was part of the game and, and, and whatever is happening now. Because as part of the game, the gaming conditions, we had a whole negotiation box where Recon comes in and speaks with the community instead of try to bribe them. And we also had representat representatives from the Ministry of Mines and Energy, Ministry of Environment, and all these guys and the actors came in and, and the music and everything. And at, at the end of the day, it was sort of testing their decisions on how much complex decisions are. And in the end, communities chose um, to favor Recon Africa because they were given packages, for instance. And this is a situation we are seeing on the ground. So this also really just shows how much these games really gives you a, uh, an idea of any reality that is happening on the ground. Um, so also some of the experiences, I mean, we have been running the games with, with lecturers, for instance, I've been running a couple of games with uh, the Namibia University of Science and Technology with the Department of Architecture and Spatial Planning. Um, and, and it's because unfortunately, I came out of that system that was so really, you know, like that was so linear. I mean, we they were architect students, we were the planners, and there was economists, and we didn't really have this relationship. So until I introduced the games to the, for instance, the, the dean of students, and they allowed me to be running this game to students. So we started establishing this relationship between the architects, the planners, and they ran games that allowed them to produce these beautiful plans for the city of Window, for instance. Um, and some of these things are, for instance, ideas like the upgrading of informal settlements, um, in a way that communities are able to have access to renewable energy and they also have access to river walks and so forth. Um, but what is actually the potential of these games? I mean, we had also the, Nambi, the University of Namibia reach out. So there is, there is the potential of creating a sustainability and, and innovation hub where students will regularly play these games as a way of providing them with a new perspective of seeing the world and installing a new system thinking lens. Um, we also recently, we just started with Upshift Namibia, which is a program that, that looks at um, educating young adolescents and preparing them for social innovation. And, and some of these games are going to be integrated within their curriculums sort of to put them into the shoes of, of uh, sort of putting them in the shoes where they are already in the industry and use the game for them to come up with these innovative ideas that will then be sponsored in real life. Um, and also the last one, obviously regular game jams. Uh, I think it's going to be happening very regularly for next year. And so it's, it's quite exciting work. And so what we are looking forward to, similar to Hans, um, I did a training of trainers in 2018, just before I departed for Stellenbosch. And we have trained about 12 young people who, been, who then taught, we taught them about the whole facilitation process um, and also how much to be, how one becomes a good listener because that's like one of the key components of the games is to be able to listen and to tap into the thoughts of participants and to allow them to reflect in a very safe space um, because mental mode shift is quite important. And some of the games can, very, can be very deep, like the one Hans mentioned, which is the privileged work. Um, so we, for next year, we're also going to have a training of trainers where we'll get new young people with the idea of saying we are going to give them these skills of running the game. So they start running them with many other young people in Namibia as a way of, of discussing the SDGs and sort of um, taking them to grassroots where they are seen as these complex frameworks for government or like high level people.
Wow. So those are a, a, also a huge array of different contexts that you're doing that in. Hans, would you like to add something more bef before I open the floor for some discussion and some contribution? Um, yeah, um, I'll, I'll probably like to add finally by saying that, you know, I firstly, let me thank, obviously, he knows this, but uh, that he chose to uh, use these games as, um, for, as a research for his master's. Uh, I think this is this is game that has a lot of potential in terms of reaching out to a lot of if, if we could reach out to a lot of people. Um, I've come to notice it might actually have a seismic shift in terms of how we approach the issues of sustainable development and sort of have a systems approach uh, when whenever we look at how we the trajectory uh, in which we want to develop our countries. Even myself, uh, being an economist student, you know, uh, I don't want to look at the economy within the prisms of, you know, just the whole from the lens of the conventional way of looking at it, you know, the capitalist versus the socialist type of a way, but just to integrate basically the issues of sustainable development in terms of the economic growth, in terms of, or uh, even just question even these uh, issues, for instance, like it's growth necessary, for instance, is, is it, although I think goal number eight is talking about economic growth, sustain economic growth, um, I, I do believe that, you know, maybe we need to start interrogating some of these questions whenever we, we want to sort of have these trade-offs in terms of economic growth versus sustainable development. So those are some of the issues. And definitely we need a whole variety of people, not just people within the profession of sustainable development in order to learn about these things, but especially the policy makers. I think that is where we really have to tap into because uh, it actually triggers down from policy all the way down to the trajectory that the country is moving. But obviously, incremental progress is very much um, of a necessity. You know, the fact that we could actually have a conversation with someone, and at the end of the day, that conversation can be moved on to another person. You know, as soon as that person learns something, then we actually could just only hope that that person, first off, have a behavioral change within themselves and try to spread the message as much as possible. That's the only hope that we have. And that's whenever we actually meet these young people, we have engaged with them to try our utmost best in order to sort of make the biggest impact uh, as, as possible. So I, I'm very passionate about these games. I think it will grow, just blossom over time. And yeah, I'm looking forward to any questions, any remarks or conversations from the rest of the folks over there. Thanks. Thanks. I think I have a question before I open the floor is, um, as you were saying um, previously, um, Reynold, that you had, yeah, that you did some some training with training the trainer to, yeah, here to listen and, you know, I had these conversations and um, Hans was also saying that you were getting funded by various foundations. Um, so I think maybe I have a more general question, which is really about what are the kinds of resources um, people would need to, um, yeah, to, to start with this, um, is it resource intensive or is it, um, and what kind, what kind of resources would that be um, in, 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 a, in, a, in a specific way? Yeah, um, well, I don't think we, they don't really require a lot of resources because I mean, when we initially started, we didn't have any funding um, and this materials that we use, bottle caps or pieces of, of wood of cards or like sticks and whatever and sort of get a way to use those to run the game um, but ideally if you really want to reach many people I mean can you require a lot of not a lot of capital but you need money like maybe for transport or so forth um, but in the end yeah the type of math and then printing obviously but most of the times we try to reduce as much paper as possible so we just create one sec one set of, of stuff that we will be using over and over, like laminating it and so forth. And a lot, a lot of the materials we really use depends, for instance, on the environment where we are running the game. So if, they, if I find myself in a village running a certain game, then I'll use materials from the river, like rocks or whatever and stuff. But it's not really resource intensive. So it's quite, yeah, it's quite minimal and it's quite easy to start with and yeah. Yeah, um, I think I totally concur with Reynold. Uh, I, I don't think it's actually very much resource intensive. 
but the only uh, hiccup would probably be, as you said, when you want to reach out to more people. Um, Namibia is a very vast country. So if you have to travel, for instance, to uh, the northeastern part of Namibia, then you'd actually, from the capital city, it would take you uh, about 20, 20 hours to actually go there. So or that, that is actually just the only resource that needs to be applied in order to reach out to the people and then have those facilitations. Great, so I think, uh, yeah, so it's the logistics about getting people together in a space and um, yeah, creativity as a huge resource, uh, learning yeah, how to be, how to think on your feet and how to sort of yeah, improvise with a group that you're with. Okay, I see we have Lisa from the Marbo who's got a hand up and um, yeah, with Bill, yeah, Lisa, can you just unmute yourself? There you go. Hi, you're yes, I am. <laughs> Lovely. Um, <laughs> so I, I love how the hearing from the two of you. Firstly, uh, Ronald, between you and Hans, that there's this empowering relationship, handing over a baton. I see. From how I hear Hans talking about how it is empowering the young people, it's empowering communities um, with agency and with awareness to act. And how you guys are talking about how you're already, people are already after playing the game, doing things. That's awesome. So firstly, my question to you is, um, how do you deal with language barriers? Does that come up? Um, and secondly, if you have now inspired me with an idea. I've been thinking nature-based solutions. Um, the context is the just energy transition. So all these communities that currently are dependent on livelihoods from coal, um, if we are, um, how do we take them along in this transformational journey? I recognize from listening to you that playing games with them um, or playing games around the ideas of that might actually be a key that can unlock something um, catalytically. So then my question to you is... Lisa, you're, you're breaking up. We just... Applying for sustainability development goals, apply that problem to the just energy transition. Um, what, how would you advise us if, who are thinking about this to tackle that problem? Great. Thanks, uh, I... Okay. Harry, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay, maybe to answer the first question, um, Fortunately, which is also a little bit sad, we have, when we get to the grassroots, we usually run them with school kids. I mean, and then, yeah, most of them uh, have a good command of English. But also, it's a very important question that you ask. And we have also been contemplating on how to sort of change um, the condition and the entire, like how to contextualize them in a way that we also run them in a vernacular that they people understand. But so far, we haven't really run them um, for instance, in a village where nobody speaks English. So it's always been at the schools or at the community hall. And very sad, sadly, is the fact that when the invitation is sent out, it's only those that could read it that come. So I think for us to really reach out, you know, to even those ones that do not understand English, we really need to change it to a vernacular that people understand. And we've had various discussions about it. So I guess it's just a thing of availability and the time to come together and to start with some of these things. But it would really be interesting, for instance, to have the games in Afrikaans or Oshiwambo or Kosa. Yeah, so. And then the second one, you were cutting, I didn't quite follow. Um, although I, I heard you speak about the renewable energy transition, like energy, trans energy transition. So I didn't hear you, you were cutting. Maybe do you mind repeating yourself? I will try. Um, if where we need to facilitate a just energy transition in those communities who are currently coal dependent to uh, 
embrace a new way of making a living um, in a, from more diverse uh, perspectives than just coal. Um, to, to achieve that shift, um, what advice would you give us um, to use games on, or what opportunity do you see for games and how should we approach it to use games in, in, um, as a catalyst in the change that's required in that complex system? Okay. Yeah, so we, I would advise for you, we have, we have a variety of games, and I remember playing this one game, Edna did, which is this educational center that teaches young people about renewable energy. Um, and then we had this game that shows, for instance, the impacts of, 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 of wood uh, on the environment, and also, but it also showed the, the, the efficiency of biogas in poor communities, for instance, and also like what solar is. So it was a very physical game where somebody had a whole bag of wood on the head and then running towards a, a rocket stove and preparing and then seeing who's going to light the fire first. So this type of game, I think number one is to really sit and get a game that, that I mean, it's not easy, but then get a game that speaks, for instance, that allows people to realize, I mean, how much efficient, for instance, um, clean energy uh, is, for instance, like for in, in communities um, where rocket stoves are easily accessible, like Cabargas, get a game that like shows the... Okay, maybe... Um, to, what, what it feels to be running on coal, for instance. And for instance, South Africa has the problem of... Um, yeah, black is it blackout? Like what's what's I'm looking for the exact word. Um, load shedding. Yeah, load shedding. Yes. So, for instance, get a game that allows them to feel what show, load shedding is, but also show them some of what people can actually do um, to, to 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 use better and efficient energy sources like biogas, and also sort of play these physical games that allows them to see the efficiency of it. For instance, the game I spoke about where somebody was running with wood on, on the head while somebody was preparing a fire with wood versus somebody preparing fire with a rocket stove versus somebody preparing fire with bargain. So this type of games allows them to really feel and to kind of see um, the differences in this and therefore also sort of motivates them to start exploring these um, this alternative uh, energy sources. And also with regards to, um, for instance, uh, low shedding, I mean, it's quite... At, at a very technical level, one can also use them um, to, to, to sort of um, prepare people that works for, for instance, like ESCOM and, 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 and how they can prepare for resilience and, and in communities as resilience at the point, at the perspective of, of, of from the perspective of uh, preparing food using all these alternatives, if, if, if I'm making sense. Maybe Hans would like to add something. Yeah, you know, Reynold, I think you're making an excellent point. But, you know, I think that these games, the bottom line or the rally cry of these games or what you hear whenever actually people give the feedback is that uh, it allows behavioral change. So, but then behavioral change doesn't only have to be about changing your own behaviors, but uh, changing how you actually behave towards the larger society as well. I think when, for instance, and that's very important when you think about a systems problem, for instance, like energy as well, you know, because co-production is large cooperation with the government. It's all these contracts at a very national level. But unfortunately, uh, because it happens at national level, you cannot just shift it at your own home and expect uh, that transition to actually happen. So what people can do is, you know, they could actually change the outlook, for instance, of how they see their politicians or what role their politi politics need to play in their lives as well. So, uh, for instance, they could become advocates on uh, the renewable energy. As soon as they learn something from these games or as soon as there's an emotional shift within how they see, see a certain type of situation. So I think it's all about just playing the game with, uh, that speaks to renewable energy, maybe just create something that speaks to the reality of the situation. And if that person becomes sort of like uh, change themselves or the way the, their perspective or their lenses, 
then that person can become advocates. I mean, we all are experts these days on Twitter and on Facebook and things. We all are very opinionated. So let's voice ourselves and let's try to hold our governments to account with regard to all this renewable energy and stuff. And I know that coal is a huge issue, for instance, in South Africa. And uh, I think if more and more people start talking about it, if those people actually go talk to their friends, if they become advocates in their own rights, in their own small world, I think it will actually multiply over time. And hopefully the government would feel the pressure just to kind of make that shift, which is needed. Because at the end of the day, politics, the power within the politics is, is what the people. So that's uh, what I think, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, I think what I've also experienced um, through the, the limited interaction and exchange that I've had um, with these um, facilitated games is that it's the, it's the power of experience. Yeah, I think yeah, the, this fact that you can inhabit the world of the game allows us to inhabit a different world. And through this experiencing of habit, inhabiting that world, um, we can start um, seeing or exposing the logic or the, yeah, the, the kind of ingrained ways of thinking that allows that world to operate the way it, it does. And then when you allow someone to inhabit a different world, which is maybe surprising or counterintuitive, um, through that, like you say, um, Reynold, um, the sensory, you know, the sensory experience of carry, carrying the wood and the embodied um, inhabiting of that space or that imaginary world, um, we can actually um, overcome our biases or experience something different. And I think that's the real power of these of these games is that it, it, it surprises um, people um, in uh, in the way that they that we that we but through the fact that we can actually inhabit a different imaginary world that and and the fact that these games are um, imaginary in a sense or that we can enter them in a non-committal way allows us to actually be more open <laughs> for experiencing something different um, and I think that's really amazing to be uh, the, the power of that so um, I think there was another question by Terry um, Terry has asked are there any other youth initiatives passionate about this kind of changes in Namibia you see your team collaborating with to expand your intervention network. So yeah, basically, who are the other youth initiatives that you're working with? Um, definitely, you know, you obviously, whenever you try to reach out to more people, then you need to work within the youth structure as well. There is something called the National Youth Council in Namibia, which basically is a youth-led national organization. It's like a government or it's an agency. Technically, it's an agency within the Ministry of Youth but it again is sort of a structure. It has all these structures, national as well as regional as constituency structures, going all the way to, down to the constituencies. So it has leadership within those structures. So these are people you could actually reach out to whenever you try to sort of engage, let's say young people from, uh, let's say a very rural area. It, it is possible that they have such a youth structure in place. It's good that Namapia has good youth structures in place that it actually allows you to just approach a National Youth Council, get in touch with the person on the ground, and then engage them as to, uh, you know what, we want to run this and this type of games, can, can we reach out to you? Uh, but I would say in the future, we are actually looking to train more other organizations because we don't have any uh, entitlement, obviously, to these games to run it ourselves. Uh, I remember just recently there was a, a guy which is, which is from um, I think a different organization that approached me and told me, you know what, what you can also do is to train us how to run these games. And then maybe we could actually go run it ourselves with different sets of young people. Uh, I think that's a phenomenal idea. You know, if we can train more youth groups in, and capacitate them in running these games, then obviously it will allow them to run it with their colleagues, with their members and then the message actually keeps spreading. So again, the agenda is basically to spread this as much as possible. Uh, but at this point in time, uh, we actually don't have any organization that we are kind of partnering with. We're doing it alone, but obviously with the engagement of, for instance, the National Youth Council as well. Yeah. 
Yeah, and, and Hans is right. I mean, there is a lot of these youth organizations, like especially getting access in youth. We usually work with organizations that have access to the youth. For instance, last year, no, this year, beginning of this year, we've run some of the games with the Namibia Institute of Democracy, and they have regular boot camps where they engage young people in civic education. So we've developed a couple of games around voting processes, both at national and regional level. And so whenever they have a boot camp, they invite us to run some of these games with them. And then they sort of use it as a medium for the discussion um, around civic education, um, especially this year with our regional and local elections. Great. Yeah, it's, I can think it's, a, it's an amazing way to make, yeah, collaborate and engage in different networks. Um, I've got a question from Nadia. Um, our colleague at CST is, is asking, have you come across any people who are hesitant to play games? I've come across some decision makers, she says, who are resistant to do anything that makes them seem less serious, look silly, reduce their authority. How can we create new cultures of creativity and playfulness in these seemingly stuffy places? Um, or maybe she says, I've just been unlucky. Have you experienced any resistance? Yes, we did. I mean, I remember there was a time um, before we went mobile, we'd usually use the House of Democracy's venue and just like um, spend time on marketing. Please come play this game. This game focuses on fishing quotas or biodiversity and so forth. And then this time around, as I was setting up the venue, and then these two guys came in from the ministry because they, they read the title was like fishing quotas and life below the ocean. And then when we when I told them no, we're just waiting for the rest of the participants to, to start playing the game. And then he was like, How are we gonna play the game? I was like, Yeah, we are going outside, we are going to be jumping <laughs> with ropes and stuff. And then we're like, Okay, we are going back to the office. So they just went, they never came back. Um, but most of the times people that we've met that have come at the beginning, yeah, like they would be probably very reluctant, but once they get into the game, they realize like it's it's really a fun way of interacting and working together collaboratively, like, you know, meeting different people and sort of discussing solutions and ideas with different people from different backgrounds. And most of them usually recommend that we go to their workplaces and run them. Like the one Hans them did the Minister of Environment and Tourism. There was also the nature, the giraffe conservation. Um, they also came to our game and then they requested that we go and run the game with their workers and maybe produce a game on human wildlife conflict. So yeah, in the beginning, some people were a bit reluctant, but once they get into the game, it's like, mm, this is a very fun and interactive way. I'm definitely coming to the next one. Yeah, just, just to add on to what Reno said, you know, the one, the, the one game, I think generally we run games with young people. So they are always keen in order to sort of engage and be part of, part of the games. Uh, but I think I remember that this one game with uh, the Ministry of Environment Tourism, these are adults, these are grown-ups, these are people that are at the office to work, and all of a sudden, you know, somebody invited them to a game and stuff. You know, at the very start of the game, at the outset, they were very ambivalent about the whole experience. Most of them would spend time on their phones and all that. Uh, but usually we'd start slow with, you know, with the presentation, just a different brief background. They thought it was going to be a whole boring thing. We went outside and then we actually played a game. And, uh, you know, as the game actually progresses, as Reno said, you know, they actually start joining in and stuff like that. So, yeah, you know, definitely there is that resistance, you know, that childishness. Uh, but I generally think as human beings, we are actually social animals. We just have to look at how babies behave, for instance, or how a kid would behave just to see what we innately innately what we are and basically what we are we are silly people we are just uh, uh we just want to have fun as much as possible and all that so uh that resistance obviously the moment that more people start doing it and it start looking cool then more people joining and they become silly or they become you know joyful you know in good mood and stuff like that so uh, i generally think you know people are programmed to behave obviously a certain way but uh, at the end of the day, instinctively, we are social animals, and those games actually allow them to be truly themselves as well. So uh, I think that actually also, to a large extent, tap into their emotions. So uh, yeah, the grown-ups are bad resistance, but also young people, I, I did not see any resistance as it does, I believe. 
thanks for yeah, your honesty and also answering that question. There's two questions, one from Timothy and another from Ruth that are sort of the same. Uh, they were asking him the jackpot question, I think, is how do you measure or evaluate the impact that these games have on people's lives? And um, of course, you know, this is for from a research perspective, always important. Yeah, but also probably for funders and um, yeah, change making. Have you have any, yeah. have any suggestions? I mean, unfortunately, it's, it's quite difficult to measure impact. I mean, but most of the times what we work with is mostly feedback forms, um, like especially during the day, like what, how was the gaming process? And then one thing that we have been looking at, I think we are very observant in a way that we've seen who often comes back to our games and yeah, sort of what are people saying after the game? And perhaps those ones reaching out saying like, listen, after the game, I decided to start this initiative. I started my own garden. I did this. But obviously, but long term, especially measuring transformation, uh, it's quite difficult, especially with this sort of incentive. And where people's web information um, and then it's, it's been observing and what we have been observing is people coming back, people reaching back and saying, this thing, I just, I started this thing after the game. I now understand the SDGs and how they function and I really want to be better engaged and so forth. But one cannot really say, I mean, that's, uh, that's like full on transformation because it's very imp uh, difficult, like just to measure like, you know, long term um, impact. Uh, yeah, I'll probably just add, you know, usually on the, uh, the, the forms, the, you know, the forms generally look good. So you, you could make the argument that, well, it's just forms, you know, after the game, you give them, they're filling in, they, you just, they just want to get rid of that. You know, that's an argument that someone can make also, you know. So they just want to get it done with, they don't want to totally disagree and all that. But also sometimes some people actually make the effort to reach out to us sometimes while well, after the games. Uh, for instance, they write an email and say, well, the games are fantastic, continue doing the great work they're doing. And then some of the folks are actually coming back, although some might not come back. So uh, this, you know, for some people, it actually makes that impact. It's also, for others, not so much, because they'll only see them once for one game and then they never come back. So, uh, but then obviously you could only try your best at that moment in time, given the time that you have, uh, given the experience, given the skills. Uh, but at the end of the day, what they do with it, you could only hope for the best. Uh, but as Reno said, it actually is very much difficult in order to have sort of a, a, a subjective view, or, I mean, an objective um, way of measuring how impactful these games are. Uh, but I, I could only hope. And as Reno said, some guys actually go out there and maybe also start their own thing as well, you know. So um, maybe they, they won't change over time, but the good thing is they learn all the time. Uh, the, the common thing is that they always learn something about sustainable development. So maybe in the future, they might actually encounter about a lot more about sustainable development and gain that passion. But for some people, it might be sort of a stepping stone for them. It might actually be a good genesis for them, just a starting point. Uh, but for others, it might actually push them even further. Uh, in order to do even creative things. Yeah, thanks. I I, I hear you, and um, my my answer, my my big question back also would be not to you, but to people who yeah, you know, we have to measure and we have to try and you know evaluate. But I think also, can we start being creative with, about how we think about impact? Because it seems that there's this monolith, there's this one idea that impact means the same across the world in all contexts. And um, how can we start thinking differently about the notion of impact? So, for example, if I just look at our conversation here today, it seems that Hans, your life has yeah, been significantly <laughs> touched or changed or shaped by having been exposed to these games. And there's no way that we can measure the work that you are doing. You have started, you know, you've started the youth coalition. You are doing, you know, this, you know, you're doing all these different kinds of things in various networks. Um, you know, so 
Reinhold is studying this now. He's you know doing this through a kind of a more formalized way, through trying to present it as research. Yeah, and uh, I think we often underestimate you know, the, the, what the notion of impact means, and we want it you know in terms of specific ways, but to try and be creative also about how we think about impact and to unpack the notion of impact. <laughs> I think <laughs> the next step in, in this discussion as to, yeah, you know, how can we actually start thinking about what it means to have different kinds of conversations with each other and what, you know, what, what it means to be able to explore things in a creative way. Um, you know, these things are often not measured yeah, in, in, in ways that are tangible, but how, how do we find a language to um, to express those kinds of effects, maybe, or the way in which things resonate with people, or um, in in a different way? I think we need um, yeah, we need a different language or vocabulary to try and convey these effects um, and the marks and the imprints that it leaves in in the intangible um, ways in people's lives, or as Nora Bateson would say, how, how the warm data becomes um, something real. So, um, yeah, I think I've, I've seen no more hands. I've seen no more questions. There are a few more remarks, um, but it seems that people are generally extremely and totally um, excited about the work you are doing, Reynold and Hans. And that is obviously something that's extremely uh, exciting and your passion and your commitment and dedication to this also is, you know, I think a part of the, the success and the, the energy that drives it. Um, there was one last request, I think, um, from, from someone, let me just see, from, from Bezaye, who just asked whether um, some of the, some of the, um, uh, talking today wasn't that clear because people broke up maybe here and there. Do you have any um, links that you could maybe just quickly post in the chat or send to me and I can send it on afterwards where people can get hold of you or um, where they can have a look at your work or connect with you or catch up with you or is there any Twitter handle that you'd like to share um, that people can sort of yeah, get kind of a visible, tangible sense of, of what you're doing. And then, yeah, if, you, if both of you just have a last sentence, um, then we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up. Yeah, I mean, we, there's a couple of links. I think it would be great to send them to you a little bit. We later put them together and then you can forward them to everybody. Um, maybe just for my last sentence to say is that, I mean, if we really want to achieve things that we've never seen before, then we need to have then we need to do things that we've never done before. And I think the games are sort of new innovative processes for uh, working towards the kind of transformation we want for our society. And yeah, we really need to find new ways of thinking. Yeah, you know, uh, definitely Reynold will probably just send through those links. As a final thought, I'll probably say, you know, thank you guys for hosting us. Thank, uh, thank you to Reynold, obviously, for uh, putting me on uh, this uh, uh, this webinar, and it, it was really an honor and privilege to actually have to engage with you guys. Uh, I would just like to say, sometimes you know, you you level the you sort of measure the level of your ambitions. For instance, uh, I was thinking, you know, due to COVID nineteen, you know, for instance, if you look at goal number one, how many people uh, would actually fall back into the extreme poverty? Uh, ratio, you know, uh, things like that. And you look at those numbers, you look at the figures due to COVID-19 and obviously the economic calamity that we happen to find ourselves. Uh, and then you actually think, are we going to achieve the sustainable development goals by year 2030 as set out by the United Nations? And um, the brutal truth to that answer is it's probably more leaning towards a no. Uh, but especially given that so many countries, especially on our continent, uh, is uh, sort of an economic backwater still to this day. And then you think, well, are we going to do that? But, uh, you know, you just wake up every day and you do the little we can. Uh, so I hope more and more people actually could do the little that they can in order to sort of contribute to the sustainable development agenda. And then hopefully we can get there, you know. So uh, I have a lot of hope, although sometimes 
uh, I'm a bit pessimistic, uh, but I, I think with time and with focus and with uh, what we are doing, maybe um, it can grow over time and expand uh, into, uh, into something big, yeah. Thank you for that. And with that positive and hopeful note, we end our webinar series this year. I wish you all a great holiday season. Be safe where you are. And we hope that, yeah, that you'll be able to rest well and looking forward to yeah, more conversations next year. Thank you very much. Thanks, Reynold. Thanks, Hans. And thanks, everyone, for sharing and participating. Bye.